right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Artist Response to a Moment. My name is Joy Davis, and I am the manager of adult and community programs here at the Walters Art Museum. And today I have the overwhelming pleasure of introducing uh, and interviewing Liz Miller to the program. Hi, Liz. Welcome. Hi. Pleasure to be here. And I figure we could hop right into the images and right into your work as we usually do. So we're just going to launch right in. We have some great stills from your film, Umbutu. Uh, and my first question here is, is performance for you an important medium to convey lived experiences? Yeah, I think um, there's something amazing about the preciousness of time and this, this ever passing sense of the present, right? The present is happening now and it would never be exactly this time again. And that it's something that I've learned over time about um, archiving that or reliving that or taking people back to a point in time or creating a new point in time uh, that references that. Um, so I just think of like performance art really embodies the preciousness of time, but it's also um, the power and intimacy in being present and being um, in each other's presence, if that makes sense. No, I, I love that, uh, especially when thinking about performance performance art, and this is a performance piece and also as a film, right? Um, and, and sort of the, both the uh, permanence and impermanence of performance arts, um, especially the, the more per permanent part comes in, in documentation, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but there is that that kind of tension there between permanence and impermanence, uh, like you said, with with not just time but the experience of of the viewer. Um, that's that's wonderful. I think we have another video here, and if you could go into a little bit more detail uh, for us as we watch uh, the snippet here um, about this piece in particular, uh, who are we seeing here um, in in this uh, in this in this footage? This is Devne Kess. Um, she was one of my performers in Ubuntu. Uh, she actually is a professional performer and um, a teacher. She is very intuitive. We did not rehearse or anything like that. We just um, actually had her just do whatever movement she felt came to her once we explained the project. And she moved intuitively. We were gonna play music, but we wanted to actually capture this train in the background and we were like, you know, skip the music. Let's just, let's just go. And she was like, okay. And she just, she just moved and her movement is incredible. I'm, I can't take credit for her movement, but I can, um, I just love how the headdress um, worked with her body and her look as well as the smoke element um, that really played into and supported the concept of the film. Absolutely. And so, this brings us to our first collection piece or collection connection from uh, the Walters collection. And we have, we'll have two images that we'll show here from our own collection here. And I'm curious what attracted you to these works and maybe we can tease out these headdresses and how maybe some people perceive them versus how, what your intention is for them. Right. Um, so oftentimes when people see my headdresses, I always call them headdresses, but oftentimes people call them crowns. And it's really funny. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and they're like, well, you make crowns. And I was like, you know, it's, it's not something that um, is upsetting in any way. I really think the work has a conversation of its own with um, whoever's experiencing it that has nothing to do with me. But when I'm constructing them, I see them as headdresses. And I think back to kind of the definition and the history surrounding crowns versus headdresses, oftentimes crowns or royalty, it's not necessarily um, a position that you've earned, but it's a position that's a bloodline. Um, and we can see those roots in, on various continents, um, not saying that anybody is deserving or less deserving, but that's just how it was set up. Um, but when we, right. yeah, when we look at headdresses, um, it has a lot of roots in um, indigenous tribal culture where you earn feathers for um, quests or acts of merit. And then when you have enough feathers, then you go to your artisan within your tribe and they construct you a headdress, but you must have gotten to that level doing things um, that are seen as acts of merit within your tribal culture. And I find that that um, is more interesting to me and feels like it captures 
the headdresses more fully um, with the way that I work with them. And I think it's interesting that the audience takes away that they're a crown, right? Because of how the uh, wearer positions themselves, just going back to what we just saw, right? Like how how the performance isn't necessarily to depict someone that's regal, but certainly the performer carries themselves in a certain way. So there's an assumption that is made, even though there's um, other layers there, deeper layers, um, uh, complex layers uh, to, to the headdresses themselves, which I'm hoping we can get into even more detail. So I'm curious for you, just between these two images, what kind of piqued your interest beyond just the, the function of the crown. Um, yeah. So for me, um, I love the imagery that is on both of these crowns. I think we're so used to seeing kind of the stereotypical crown um, that's metal and these have an embodied narrative, which I think is powerful. Um, I don't do pictorial work with my crowns or headdresses, but I think on their own, because they're made with black hair, because they're made in different colors, because they have these abstract designs and these braids and these twists, I think they have their own narrative that is um, somewhat locked into the Black culture. So if you're part of Black culture, you're like, ooh, that's a Senegalese twist or that's, you know, this kind of braid or that's a Bantu knot. I like that headdress because there's stories that go along with different hairstyles and there's different um, hair textures that respond to different hairstyles. So I feel like we have our own narratives within our, our hair stories, if that makes sense. And so these crowns have narratives as well. And I will say, just going back to um, one of your first points is that the shapes are more aligned with the shapes that you that you work with, right? Like they're not necessarily so um, symmetrical or traditional in the sense of like a, a European style crown, right? That is um, uh, something that is in the lexicon in our visual lexicon of every day. Uh, even just thinking about the the show, The Crown, right, um, which is is a popular show on on uh, streaming services. So um, I, I just thought that was so so key to to your work. Mm -hmm. That there's there's ver variety there and diversity in in style. Absolutely. And I'm curious um, to talk more, to dig even deeper into headdresses. Um, how do you incorporate them into your work beyond the performance or maybe even within the performances that you uh, create and direct? Yeah, so the, the headdresses are meant to elevate the performer. They're meant to invoke something in the performer. I don't manipulate it too much. It's actually very similar to how I work with dancers in my studio um, as a choreographer is that I'm not really looking to give too much direction, I want to unlock something that already exists in the performer. I'm not trying to make them like me or copy me, do what I do, but rather um, it's very much a collaboration. So these headdresses are meant to unlock something in the performer. Um, some of the performers actually chose their headdresses out of sketches. And then I made them for the performer and had them send me head measurements and all of that. But then their movement, um, reflects how that headdress fits, how it, um, how their body responds to the hair and all of that. And I think that that's more of a reflection. That's just um, art imitating life. We do that anyways. Depending on how I'm wearing hair, my hair depends on if it's over my shoulder or I'm gonna flip it back or, you know, if I'm gonna wear a scarf that day, I think it's a reflection of um, life, yeah. Something that you mentioned, I think I'm skipping a little bit ahead in our questions, but I think it's relevant here, where there's architectural elements that kind of marry with your headdresses. And of course, we, we focus a lot on the headdress, but there's also the surroundings, not just the wearer, right, which is as much of an import, but also the architecture that we're seeing um, between these two images. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that just a little bit. Yeah, um, I work very intuitively and we really just explored spaces. I had a list of sites that I wanted to cleanse with colored smoke, sites that had really twisted histories or powerful histories like um, Black Wall Street that Kay was at with that fence. Um, and then uh, Karma, who was hanging on the sign, that's in front of Lexington Market. And so while we were there, it was like, we work intuitively. I was like, oh my gosh, karma, what if you climbed up there and you just like, you know, reached out on the sign and we just, you know, it was playful. It was fun. You know, we have this ceremonial element with the smoke, but we're also looking to um, 
capture the black body, you know, in a positive, elevated, powerful way, you know? And so we work with whatever we have. And that book that um, Kay is reading behind that fence, that book, Kay just showed up and was like, I brought a book with me that's perfect. And I was like, oh my gosh, like it's just that collaborative element where somebody's excited about the concept and the work and they they bring something of themselves to it. And so I'm just really blessed to be able to uh, capture it and witness it and share it. And one, one thing that you brought up that I think I need to use as I uh, walk through and, and use language is thinking about it intuitively in, instead of it being kind of kismet, right? Is being intuitive to the moment and understanding the work. And uh, I think that speaks to you as an artist and, and your kind of directorial role, but also to how people, even the people participating in the work respond to kind of what they're tasked with, whether that's to intuitively think of their body in a new way or in, in you know, uh, uh, place the, the headdress on their head and like move and maneuver within that, right? Because this is a completely different style of headdress that we're seeing here in this slide in comparison to this one, right? There's different things you have to actually do with your body to, uh, I wouldn't say compensate, but to um, work with uh, the headdress. Yeah, and if I can speak back to that, if you go back to the last slide, um, Kay actually had wings on. If you see the kind of um, wire kind of behind her, she has these full scale wings that are easier to see in the film. And then I had this random hair feather that I had made that I was like, let's just wrap this around your head and pin it. And so like, um, yeah, and you can see the elastic straps on her shoulders because I was like, we're just going to strap this to you and see what happens. And she's a tiny person and those wings were astronomical. So, yeah. <laughs> Again, some more of that intuitive uh, um, thinking about it. And you, you spoke a little bit about materiality. And I was curious, uh, I think we have an image here, yes, of you making um, uh, one of your creations. And if you could talk a little bit about what you're making, but also just the general materiality of your work and, and um, why you use the materials you use. Yeah, so um, I just, I think when speaking about the black body, which, you know, even though it's about hair, it's the reference of the body, right? Because hair is almost always, like it's on the body, we live within hair, it's covering our entire skin, right? It's rooted in our skin. Um, so when you're talking about hair, you're talking about body, whether you realize it or not. And the black body is very um, charged, racially charged, especially in our society. We really struggle with acknowledging the humanity of it, um, acknowledging it as not property anymore, um, all kinds of stuff. I could say so much. But um, so fake hair, one, I'm an artist that does not make a lot of money. So fake hair is affordable for me. It, um, I also am very much a tactile artist. I like how things feel. And so working with thread and you can, you can see my dog was eating during that whole video, <laughs> working with um, thread and things that feel a certain kind of way really works for me. I'm definitely a hands-on artist. I could never do digital. Um, but even these hair feathers, they were made with um, a water-based glue. And so that's like soft hair that we like combed out and made it look like um, a feather. And when it dried, we just peeled it off of plastic and it's this beautiful architectural, you know, feather. Wow. That's that's wild to think about how how even synthetic hair, hair in general, but how malleable it is and how black hair specifically is very malleable and is um throughout history been treated as malleable as a as a medium even as it sits on our head, right? Um uh, how malleable it is. So that that's so interesting how you you continue to work that and push that um in in your work. I love this image. I also just love the the cameo of your dog. Um. <laughs> he had his whole dinner during this video and he literally had to climb through the sculpture to get to his bowl. And I was like, you know how mommy does, you want your food, you better go get it. Like, <laughs> need this space. It's, you know, and it's a question that I asked earlier in uh, us having artist talks in the digital space is, you know, how are you coping in the space and using your space and, um, you know, making compromises for, for the ones we love. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm curious for, for you, uh, and this is relational to this film here, but just in general, how do you hold on or preserve your work? And do you consider this like an important part of your art practice or your mission in general, like the labor of hair 
and self-care. Yeah. Um, that was a lot of questions in one. Yes. <laughs> so mostly the work doesn't need a lot of uh, help being preserved. It's wire, it's plastic thread, it's um, glue. So a lot of that um, is pretty archival in its base. Um, so preserving it is mostly just maintaining it because obviously when it's a wearable piece and somebody wears it and performs it, it needs a certain about, uh, amount of maintenance. And yet at the same time, um, I don't want to repair anything because there's something about it becoming a ceremonial object that is important. You know, it is, it has the sweat of the performer that wore it. And that is something that's sacred, whether we realize that or not. And it has the wear and tear because it was used in a, a ceremonial or a ritual performance. And why should I fix it to be perfect again? You know, it's kind of like, you know, for black people, when we take our hair out, that hair has our sweat, our DNA in it. And so it's a powerful piece of this work. Um, yeah. What was the other part of the question? <laughs> Great question. How do you preserve your work, but also do you consider the preservation of your work and holding on to it um, and the mediums important part of your art practice and your just general art mission? Yeah, so somewhat, yes. Um, so the objects, I have been holding on to them due to a certain deadline with a thesis show, but um, for me, I don't know that it's, and maybe I'm hoping this is answering the question, but um, for selling the works, because it is seen as kind of a ritual or a ceremony, there's a sacredness and a connection that I would need to have to a collector to understand, I may need to borrow this piece in the future. You know, we need to sign a contract. I'd be happy to install this in your house, but it's not something that you handle on a regular basis, right? And for them to understand what the work means, not to just be like, this is a pretty object that I want to display in my home, but rather this object brings me power, brings me life, helps me understand my black experience better. Like that's what I'm hoping that these um, headdresses would do for somebody who would be wanting to have it in their possession, so. And it's really interesting to think about the longevity of your work. Um, it came up in a recent artist talk as well uh, about that, um, both that maybe that's not necessarily the label of the artist, but also if you do consider it, you have um, an extra, I guess, tool in your toolkit, right? To understand your work beyond maybe um, your current use, right? In case you use it again, but also as it is collected, what do you want? from let's say a museum or even a gallery or like you said, a collector. Um, and how do you see uh, your work being preserved long-term? So uh, it, it may seem simple, but it certainly um, beyond just the um, ritual importance of your work, but it, just thinking about that um, is, is, uh, is, is really great. Um, um, and an extra, an extra skill, <laughs> an, extra, an extra node uh, to think about. All right. My next question, I'm gonna skip over architectural elements because we talked about it a little bit there with the, uh, the um, uh, progress shot there. I'm curious, we're gonna dig into you as a teacher a little bit. Um, it's something that I find is um, just, just as important as your art practice. Maybe you think it is, um, but I certainly do. And it, it's, uh, you're very, um, what should I say? You're you're very open about how you work with your students. And I think that's um, such an asset, but also something that other teachers, you know, don't necessarily have the muscle to do, right? You go, like, it's it's a job at the end of the day, right? And of course you love your job and you um, you find it, and you might find it enriching, but you, you take it to another level, right? And share kind of what um, your students uh, do and kind of the, the message behind those projects. So we're gonna flip between these two images and I have a question for you um, because you are a teacher and educator and have been for 17 years and you currently work in the Baltimore City school system um, and you also have experience doing dance as well as art. And I'm curious, how does teaching support your art practice and then also vice versa? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... You know, I would say that like the type of work I've chosen to do, doing race work, doing work about heavy things, um, it's very necessary. But like when I work with children, there is so much joy um, working with children and like just 
them being excited and them showing me their work and like understanding the power of an encouraging word and understanding the power of mentors and people who speak life to you. And especially in Baltimore City, the school that I work at is 95% African-American and the power that I wield to show them and introduce them to black artists, artists that look like them, artists in the queer community, artists in the Asian community, Latino community, like artists that they, um, they may not, experience people of different cultures that much, you know? And so having that power to not only show them representation of huge, amazing black artists that are making a difference, but also speaking life to them. Like I even was telling a coworker today who was like, are you talking to your kids about, you know, Baltimore Design School and Baltimore School of the Arts? And I was like, I made it an assignment. Look at this and talk to your parents. Like, you know, just consider it. And then even when I'm grading work, I'll say, please consider going to an arts high school and I can work with you on your portfolio. I just think it's a powerful role that our educators play as well as, especially during a pandemic, these children need a place to put all of what they're going through and art is a perfect place to channel any pain, any joy, any feeling that you're feeling. It's a beautiful place to work through it. Um, and I definitely want those kids to have that regular practice, that creative practice. If it's with me or even if with, it's without me. And I love that the idea of channeling, no matter whether it's a positive, negative or neutral energy, but channeling that somewhere, especially in the um, space that they were in, the era that, we in, that we're in that was already digital, but now add on the pandemic, which is predominantly now digital and reliance on that. So how do you tap in? As, as a child, right? How do you tap into to those creative uh, endeavors and those mediums, right? To even know what those mediums are, not to assume a lack of knowledge, but just like, how do you do that as a, as a kid in, in um, at this time and in this space? Maybe even as adults, I think we might need some, some assistance with that, Liz, um, <laughs> to tap into those mediums um, and, and yeah, to use them. Yeah, I totally agree. this image here. As a follow-up, I'm curious how you incorporate, um, you spoke a little bit to this actually, but how do you incorporate community elements or components into your work as a teacher uh, or maybe even in your own art practice? Hmm. So community elements that I work in with my students, this project that you can see was a collaborative work um, across most of the school, I think third grade and up. So I teach pre-K through eight art. And we just did like one day projects of you're either cutting water bottles into soft spirals or you're coloring them with Sharpies. And this is a water bottle chandelier, which you can find water bottle chandeliers on Google images. They're not great, um, <laughs> but we looked at, well, I looked at the water bottle and I was like, how do we make this like a Dale Chihuly chandelier, which is what it's meant to be, right? And so we kind of re-examined that and I work with wire. So it was pretty easy for me to think about how do we create an armature that this will actually work. But this work mm -hmm. is basically the work of third graders through eighth graders bringing in um, water bottles and recycling them together. And um, it's not quite finished, but when it's finished, it's really marvelous. And I even played with putting a light bulb inside and seeing how it lights up from within. And um, it's pretty fantastic. The kids freak out when they see it. They're like, oh my gosh, you know. But for myself, um, the work that I did in my film, one, my work in general is about blackness, the black experience, the black body through history. But the film was about this collaborative need to cleanse historic spaces. And we go on a journey from, mm -hmm. um, you know, when slaves were brought to the Inner Harbor, they went to Lexington Market and then leftover slaves would go to Fells Point, you know, but we also, um, there was a slave pen about a block from there. You know, there's all these historic sites that we cleansed and like, I could have danced it. I could have done the whole film, but I thought it was important to use community members and each of the people in my film is a different kind of um, operating member of the community in a different way. We even have Nicoletta De La Brown in the film and she cleanses a Confederate uh, pedestal. It's just really powerful work. We even cleansed the corner where Freddie Gray was last seen alive. And so all these performers, you know, they wear a different headdress, each one, and they do movement that feels intuitive to them, to the, the sanctity, but also the tragedy of the space that needs to be wiped away and wiped clean to move forward, right? 
And I think that's uh, what you just brought up both just hit me, number one. But number two, I think it's important in thinking about pain of the past, also trauma of the past, how do we heal from that, but not in a dismissive or let's just get over it way, right? Because I think that, that there's a difference that we're talking about here, which is about cleansing, is about healing, is that step before moving on. And it's also about remembrance. It's not about just completely moving on and um, dismissing the past, other ex other experiences. And so it's, it's just, it's great that you're doing that work, but also bringing other people in um, so like you said, so you could have done all of those things, but bringing other people in, it adds a different meaning and a different layer, um, to, to the subject, uh, to your mission. Yeah. And we even thought about, I mean, like we had conversations in the spaces, like we know that ancestors of ours literally walked here, probably barefoot, you know, and like, how do we tap into their energy, cleanse the space, but also use that energy to empower us to move forward, to live fully in the way that they could not. Right. Like, how do we acknowledge what happened and yet um, live out our full selves and unlock parts of ourselves? Right. Right. Uh, these are a couple of other images, uh, concept drawings for for headpieces. Um, and I think we're going to go I think our next image here. Yes, is uh, concept drawings. I love, um, it's a little long, but I love uh, just the tactile nature and the ritual of this. So we're going to play the whole thing. Um, and as you were talking about how um, the performers in the film were actually going through these images themselves. So this is actually the process that they were going through and choosing their headdresses, right? Yeah, I sent them this link and I was like, Okay, you're gonna have to tell me what number it is because I don't, I didn't decide to put any letters or anything on them. Um, but a couple of the performers got to choose exactly what they wanted. Um, and in the film, you can hear them talking in the background about um, why they chose the one that they chose. Um, and few people, we ended up, um, it was more last minute. And so we had a couple of headdresses available and I was like, this one feels like you. And so they were, um, you know, positioned in that way. That's wonderful. Um, and were all of these physically realized or are some still kind of on the drawing on the drawing table? So most of them are still on the drawing table. I find all of them really exciting. Um, and I actually have created some other ones more intuitively. Like it's really funny, you, you start making it and maybe it's based on a photo and then it just goes a whole nother direction. So there's a few of these that I'm like, oh my goodness, like I gotta do this one. It's so insane, right? Or it's so absurd. I just want to see what it'll be like, right? Um, so no, most of these have not been realized. <laughs> but that's great. There's just, um, you know, high production is important, right? So like see really a great landscape of what you can work with. Um, and then you see some of that, some at least the piece of that realized and you're like, oh, I can imagine this. I think you already mentioned this, but you can imagine it in a new way or tweak it or reuse. Um, so there's there's just a good exercise as an artist um, in, in doing that. I love seeing the notes and just like the, just like the scale. Um, I'm nerding out right now, but that's, um, <laughs> I just love seeing that. Hopefully the audience is enjoying it as well. So as we wrap up and we go into audience questions, I see that there are a lot of questions. If you haven't asked, um, haven't typed in your question on Facebook or on YouTube yet, please go ahead and feel free to do that now. My last question for you, Liz, is what do you want audiences to get out of your work? Hmm. You know, I, I'd have to say that I don't have a specific wish for what somebody would receive, I would actually just hope that they open themselves up to the content, open themselves up to hearing um, what people say about it, how people react to it. Because um, I've found that the work, depending on your background, depending on your um, comfort with hair or race or any of that, it really determines how you react or what you see the material as. I've had people say, is this carpet? Is this thread? You know obviously black people respond a different way. <laughs> They're usually like, oh, that's fake hair. There's something for me here, you know, like when they come in a gallery and they see it. Um, but I would mostly just want people to be open to the material and open to what it's saying. Cause I feel as though it's very Afro futurist and at the same time reaching backwards. And so there's a connection to the present in the way that we're reaching backwards to go forwards. And I would just hope that um, 
Like that's a very universal thing. We're talking about race mm -hmm. here, but I think it's very universal to look backwards, even at yourself, to move forwards in a healthy way, right? So um, yeah, just to be present and just to be open is what I would hope people would come to the work with. And then whatever they receive is, you know, where they're at on their growth journey. I love that. Some little nuggets of self self work in there. Um, and you have a lot of questions. We're not going to hold you too long, but I do want to get to a few. Um, we'll start with uh, anti Dropley. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. Um, what got you inspired to become an artist? Was it because someone else inspired you, or I'm guessing the extra part of this is, or was it your own um, kind of prompting? Mm. That's a great question. Um, well, my father is an artist. He's a fine artist. He's a painter. Um, I grew up just thinking, you know, a certain things were normal. Like, oh, my dad's painting the front and back of his studio door at three in the morning. That's normal, you know, or um, on Saturday afternoon, he pulls my hair into a side pony and draws me for an hour, you know, or I'm modeling for his art classes, um, you know, a day a week. It's just for me, or there's an oil pastel of my a uh, sister and a painting of me overlooking our Thanksgiving table. <laughs> like it just was a part of my life and it's something I continued. And I think it took me a long time to understand that this was who I was, but my father said something to me. He never pushed me to do art, but he said something to me once that really made me think. Um, and I said, you know, dad, do you think I could be a professional artist? He's a college professor in art. And he said, um, he took a long pause and he said, honey, people with half your talent make a career out of this. And he was like, I think you owe it to yourself to try. That's that's high praise. That's high praise to just like say, yeah, you're you're already there, right? Not that you have to get there, but you're already kind of there. So <laughs> like we have the genetics, just work with what you got. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's wonderful. And that explains, we were talking offline about your confidence and I, I see where it comes from. Um, that, that, you know, parental guidance is, you know, it helps to to support, support some of that. Um, okay, we have a lot of really great comments. There's a lot of people saying they love the progress videos. So um, maybe that's just me hinting or the audience hinting, wink, winking, that you should include that in your shows in the future because people just love to see it. Um, let's see, what other questions do we have here? From Mandy Bear on YouTube, um, they say, what about the the organic park piece. Um, I love that one. Maybe you could speak a little bit more to that. I'm not sure which piece in particular you're referring to. Do you know which piece? Is this a friend? It's my sister. Uh -huh. Aha, the sister chimes in. Perfect. <laughs> um, so on my Instagram, I know we're going to share that a little later. There's a highlight that says um, Cage Oasis. So I've only done really one outdoor piece where I constructed an egg shaped cage. It's huge, it's like five feet tall. And I hung it in a tree, but there's tracks that are along um, some of the largest branches. And it ended up kind of being what I thought would be a bird cage, but not, right? It would be an oasis where birds could come and they could hide and the hair would move in the breeze. And I was like, it's plastic hair, it's plastic tracks. It'll probably hold up under weather. And so that piece is in um, Gwyn Falls Park. There's even a map um, under the highlight if you want to go find it. <laughs> it's pretty fun. That's awesome. Oh, well, thank you to uh, your sister for even bringing that up because I think that's fantastic for people to be able to go and, and uh, find it. And also look on, on to your Instagram, which we'll put up uh, momentarily. Uh, Laurel, Laurel Baldwin Garcia asks, is your film series available for viewing? or will it be shown publicly at a later date? Yeah, so um, Ubuntu, I'm about to make it public. However, through my website, you can go to Liz Ann Miller. We're gonna show that again at the end. Um, if you click on the Ubuntu tab and click on the picture, it'll take you right to the film. Um, the film is about 25 minutes. We did a bunch of screenings this summer, um, but it's definitely it's definitely there if you're interested and it's, it's really powerful. It's something to kind of sit down with and kind of chew on, right? Yeah, and really rewatch, right? There's, it really is, um, while it's not heavy with dialogue, it really is something that you will catch new things mm -hmm. as you watch it. 
um, just from personal experience, but also just in us talking about it, there were things in us preparing for this. I was like, I didn't see that. I will be rewatching it now just to kind of pick up on those elements, right? Um, and here we are. We have your your website, which is lizannmiller.com. And also you can find Liz um, at Liz underscore Miller underscore productions on Instagram and Facebook. So we have a few more questions if you if you're willing. Absolutely. And oh, some says, um, yeah, everyone's really loving the sketches and all of the um, <laughs> all of the all the footages. Um, there is a question here about what drives you from um, bossy mental. What drives you to so many different projects and forms of experiment experimentation to express your art? The dense question. <laughs> Um, well, I would say, you know, grad school kind of gave me a kick in the butt. Grad school and school in general um, really pushes you to create. But it also, for me, my grad school experience was extended. It's a longer program, but it creates a sense of momentum. And for me, I needed that momentum. I needed to build that speed. And so I work very intuitively. There's, I always have enough materials um, and I'm exploring doing prototypes. So for me, it's also... Um, curating my, it's kind of weird, but curating my social media feed. Um, mm. I curate and I think about who I follow. I don't follow people cat videos, sorry. Like, it's just, I, I particularly have accounts where I follow like black channels, black art, things that are really gonna empower me, um, work that's about geometry, cause I use a lot of geometric shapes. And so things that I'll just save them. I just save posts because I'll go back through them and be like, this is a headdress and then I'll sketch, right? Or I'll just feel, I often work very intuitively so I can feel there's a headdress coming. I have it like mm -hmm. in my mind, I can feel the hair already. I'm like, I gotta get that wire going. I gotta, you know, but I'm also trying to fortify my work. So part of it is knowing it's not about how many headdresses I'm churning out, but it's also working backwards. Like what is the quality? What problems am I experiencing? Um, like I'm working on the part that connects specifically to the head and I'm trying to make sure I'm doing a very high quality work so that the ones that I build are the highest quality that I'm capable of. And I'm always um, moving forward in that. That's wonderful. Um, I know this is going to be maybe the hardest question you've gotten all day, but Bossy Mental also asks, um, as we have uh, all your all your socials up here, um, Bossy Mental asks, also, uh, which headdresses are in your top three or your favorite so far? Uh, if you don't want to offend the headdresses, you can say you have a favorite. <laughs> no, I know they're all my children. No. <laughs> um, you know, I, I honestly can't say that I have any that are my favorite. Um, they all are really powerful in their own way. Um, they all have had their own journey, their own experience. There is one that's brand new where I started, um, somebody gave me their hair, which I, is something new I'm incorporating at people who cut off all their hair, especially for black women, um, women in general, but specifically black women, when they cut off all their hair, that's an event and it's really sacred and it's a transformation of self. And I have a fellow art teacher that gave me her dreadlocks. She was kind of shy about it. She's like, um, I saved your dreadlocks. I've been saving, or I've been saving them for like a month. Um, can I give them to you? Like, I feel weird, you know? And I was just like, that is so special. So I made a crown and it has these beautiful gems in them and it has her little dreadlocks like woven like lattice on them. And so wow. I just, I'm excited about that new line of investigation about using real hair in with the fake hair and how that changes the energy to the piece, so. That's that's amazing. It's it's interesting, um, you know, in thinking about how how you're continuing to to work not only at this time but just with with folks in your in your orbit, right? Like we've all kind of created our own orbits, especially in general, right? But especially in COVID time, right? Um, it's it's even more important who our or is in our orbit, and so um, it's it's so great that you're continuing to do the community work even during the pandemic when it seems almost impossible to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, that brings us to the end of the program. I want to thank Liz for being here, for being such a, a diligent and awesome host. Um, 
please feel free to check out Liz. Rewatch this if you caught us in the middle um, and follow Liz on all uh, all of her platforms. Please feel free to also check us out on the walters.org slash events where you'll find more artist talks like this. Um, I would be remiss if I did not thank the digital team and my coordinators um, in uh, adult and community programs and uh, in MNC and the marketing and communications department for helping us with this without the digital team this would not happen. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you, most importantly, to our audience. Thank you so much for engaging so much. We have even more questions here. So uh, and comments some really great comments. So thank you so much for engaging with us from program to program. And we will see you in the next one. Bye for now.